Well, I've titled this message, Available for a Miracle. Kind of went back and forth on what to say about this message, what to title it. I want to tell you a story that happened to me as I made myself readily available to anybody and anyone, especially my mentor, Pastor Scott, when I first got saved. I mean, I was willing to do anything. I remember when I met Patty that we did this army-themed messages, and I actually attached a parachute to the top of the sanctuary. Was, I've never been afraid of heights. I climbed an extension ladder with the extension up through the middle, put my leg over the top rung, and put my foot through one of the rungs in the ladder and bent over backwards, uh, attaching a parachute. I was willing and ready to do anything. And so we had this group of young adults. And listen, I'm not saying that you have to do this, okay? That we would go out into the darkest, deepest regions of Jacksonville, Florida that are not safe and would go out amongst the prostitutes and you know, tough neighborhoods, go into these neighborhoods and witness to the glory of God and to Jesus Christ. And so to this day, you don't wanna go to this intersection in Jacksonville, Florida. It's the north end of the city. It's the intersection of 8th and Main. And anybody that's from Jacksonville knows that you don't go out there at certain times unless you wanna die. So we're out there witnessing at midnight. A bunch of young adults and I are out there. And I was just willing to do anything for Jesus. I was ready to speak of Jesus, tell of Jesus. And it may sound a little crazy, but this, this is exactly what happened in this story. I walked into this bar and there was no door on the front. Now you couldn't get away with this in 2023, but there was no door. I don't know if somebody had knocked it off that day, but I walked right in, there was no door. Some pool tables to the left, some tables to the right, and a bar right in front of me, and I'm like, I'm coming in here to witness to somebody by myself. We we're all spread out all over this, this area. So I walk into this bar and there's a couple sitting there and I sit right down next to them at the bar and I start talking to them and I find out, you know, they're slightly inebriated. I find out that the wife is a Catholic lady. And this is a wild and crazy place. I'm sitting there conveying the gospel of Jesus Christ to this couple and some really strange things kind of manifested over here at the pool table. Somebody gets in a fight. Beer bottles are breaking. This is all happened Why I'm talking. I kid you not. It's gonna sound a little fascinating, kind of fantastical, but this is exactly what happened. So this is going on, and I'm still talking to them, and this woman starts to cry, and I know that she's drinking, and she asked me about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit because she had a Catholic background. She wanted to know what the unpardonable sin was. And at that time, I don't even remember what my answer was. It wasn't a good one, I can tell you. I was only like two years old in the Lord. I understand that passage a whole lot better. I don't even know what I told this lady. And so the waitress comes up to me, up to us, while I'm talking to this dear lady, this couple, and she goes, that's not what it is, and she like freaks out and starts yelling at me. That's not what the unpardonable sin is. She just starts yelling at me. I'm like, okay, what's going on here? And it just felt like, pure manifestation. If you don't believe in demons, we've seen them up close and personal. They're real. I just want you to know. This woman just tripped out in front of me. She's the waitress. She goes away. I start to minister to this family. She comes back. The same waitress comes back 10 minutes later and totally agrees with everything I'm saying. It's totally calm. I'm like, man, this is a, this is a weird show going on right now. It's a freak show, man. It's, I'm conveying she's crying, she's receiving it, and again, it sounds a little fantastical, but this is what happened. There's a bartender there, he's got a hat on, he's got a scar across his face like this. He starts yelling at me to get out of the bar because I'm disrupting their business or whatever, and so he does like this at me. He faints at me like he's gonna punch me, and of course, like I'm like, Jesus, Jesus, I'm about to die right here. And he does that while he's yelling at me, a cross falls out between the buttons of his shirt. And I said, hey, I see you got a cross. And dude, he took two steps backward and just went completely calm. 
I don't know if his Holy Ghost grandmother gave him that cross, but it stopped him dead in his tracks. And he said to me, he's like, why don't you just go? You're disrupting the business here. Why don't you go? Was, you know, I'm myself talking really loud to this person. I was like, okay, that was crazy. I walk out the door where there's no door and there's a kid sitting there, teenager, shouldn't even be out at this time at night on his bike. It's like 17 or 18 years old. And I said, buddy, you're the next victim. I'm gonna tell you about Jesus. And I led that teenager to Christ right there in front of that bar past midnight in one of the, one of the most dangerous places in all of Jacksonville. And I have found out when you make yourself available, God can cause miracles to happen in your life. I wanna read a story from the book of Acts where Peter had to go through a huge paradigm shift in his life. Things had to change. He was raised up in a Jewish-centric culture. He was raised up by parents that taught him how to be a good Jewish boy. And all of a sudden, the promised Messiah comes and destroys the old paradigm. And something so new has risen up that Peter has a hard time making the change. You know, religious people, hear me. We can get so committed to something that we adhere to something that doesn't really matter. It happens all the time. God will cause a new revival to burst forth in the body of Christ, and guess who resists the revival more than anybody? Not sinners, saints that had the last revival because they're so attached to what happened, the forms, the methods of what God did yesterday that they actually find themselves resisting what God wants to do today. So some of the things that we hold so dearly to are the very things that are holding God back from moving in your life. So let's just make ourselves available and have an open mind. Who's ready for the Holy Spirit to lead them in their life? Say amen this morning. So Acts chapter 10 and verse 17. I gotta give you a little background. Peter has just had a vision and three times a great sheet from heaven goes down and empties out all these unclean animals and says, God says to him, arise and eat. And Peter says, no Lord, I've never let any of those things pass by my lips. I've never eaten any of those things and God tells them, listen, Peter, it's a new paradigm. Don't call common what I've made holy. How many of y'all realize that is a huge shift? For thousands of years, Jewish people had all of these kosher eating laws. And God is trying to get Peter out of the old way of thinking into something new. And so he has to show him three times Anybody else needed God to confirm something in your spirit more than once? He's like, okay, God, come on, wave at me if, if that's been your experience. So God shows him this three times. And then this passage unfolds. Here it is. Now, while Peter was greatly perplexed in mind as to what the vision which he had seen might be, it's pretty obvious it's pretty obvious. God spoke directly to him, gave him a vision. Behold, the men who had been sent by Cornelius. Now God had spoken to a Roman centurion to send men to Peter at the same time that Peter's having this vision. Having asked directions for Simon's house, appeared at the gate and calling out, they were asking whether Simon, who was also called Peter, was staying there. While Peter was reflecting on the vision, the Spirit said to him, behold, three men are looking for you. Wow. Now this is prophecy and this is God moving that I'm interested in. I believe God wants to speak specifically to Christians, to you, to move you into places that maybe you've never moved in before. We want some great prophet to come into our church and tell us everything. We say, wow, that's a prophetic move. No, God wants to move supernaturally in your life. Don't wait till the superstar preacher shows up. He wants to use you. He used a Roman centurion. He wants to use you. He wants to flow supernaturally through your life. But get up, go downstairs, and accompany them without misgivings. For I've sent them myself. Peter went down to the men and said, Behold, 
I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for which you have come? They said, Cornelius, a centurion, a righteous and God-fearing man, well spoken of by the entire nation of the Jews, was divinely directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and hear a message from you. So he invited them in and gave them lodging, and on the next day he got up and went away with them. And some of the brethren from Joppa accompanied him. I'm gonna tell you the rest of the story, at least the highlight of the rest of the story later in the message. But what a crazy risk. God entrusts the gospel to these fishermen and tax collectors and zealots. They weren't the most qualified. He changes the paradigm so much. I have to be honest with you. We look back with hindsight, but I wonder if I would have enough in my makeup to actually make the shift and the change that the disciples had to make. So many people rejected it because it was so different. People thought that Jesus was trying to tear down the law and he said, I've come to fulfill it, but they couldn't put it together. What if God wants to do something in your life this morning that'll make you just ultimately available for him to use you? I will never get into your sphere of influence the way that you're in it. I will never be able to impact the people in your sphere of influence like you can impact them. And I'm just telling you this morning, it's not left up to professional clergy to get the job done. We are all ministers of reconciliation and God wants to miraculously use your life. Amen? He wants to use you. And I'll tell you, I've had people in my life who have made themselves available and I have seen God do miraculous things all the time. I don't think Tammy Jocelyn's here in the early service. But I've watched this woman for two decades see a need out on the street and even before she had provision to meet it, even before she had people to help her, even before she had a place to minister to people, God miraculously has provided thousands of times for people because she made herself available. She made herself available. I love that. That's amazing and that's what God wants to do in your life. God had to show Peter this vision three times to get him off of square one, to get him out of the old paradigm. Folks, I believe God is raising up a body of believers where it's no longer a spectator sport. You see, we come to church to see a miracle when God wants to use you out on the street to cause a miracle. We've got it backwards, folks. We're not coming to church to see a miracle. God wants to perform a miracle through your life. That's how it works. And we're all ministers of reconciliation. Now, Peter goes down. Now listen, if eating this food that he considered unholy was not enough, God asked him to go to a Roman centurion's house. You understand that Rome is the occupying oppressive army that's occupying Israel. Peter didn't want to have anything to do with Gentiles before he got saved. He was strictly forbidden to live or be in a Gentile's house. Not only has God said, all this food is holy for you now and you can eat it, what? Jews are gonna reject it based on that alone. But now you're asking me to go to the enemy's army house, this guy, the centurion's house, what? Watch what happens. Peter goes down, he preaches the gospel while Peter was still speaking, verse 44 of chapter 10. While he was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit, right in the middle of the message, fell upon all those who were listening to the message. This can happen to you. When we get out of the old spectator Christianity, we get out of, hey, I'm gonna come and consume something at church Christianity, and we allow God to use us in the middle of your sentences at work, in the middle of your sentences at school, in the middle of your sentences when you're checking out at Walmart, the Holy Spirit can fall down right there. He is not, he's not kept in a, in a cage. He's not kept by four walls. He is loose to move in your life whenever you make yourself available. Man, I tell you, 
And here's what it boils down to. We gotta overcome our own objections. Peter had a bunch of object, objections why he couldn't be used in this moment. I've never associated with a Gentile. I've never gone into a Gentile's home. I've never eaten that kind of meat. Get over it. God's doing something new. I believe with all my heart, I've said this many times and in many ways, that it's not gonna be one preacher or one church or one superstar communicator or worship team. It's gonna be grassroots army. It's gonna be the body of Christ rising up and fulfilling its mission. All of us being ministers of reconciliation. All of us as parts of the body fulfilling what Jesus wants done here on earth, folks. I'm telling you, we gotta overcome our old objections. Sitting and watching church happen is not enough. God wants to use you. You are the minister, you are the pastor, you are the evangelist, you're the prophet, you're the teacher wherever you're at. I pray this morning that your eyes are open, that God wants to use you. And it really, there's really no option. That's what he wants to do, he wants to use you. So Peter had to get over all this stuff and he reminds me a lot of Moses. Now, when we think of Moses, a lot of us, you know, we kind of envision Charlton Heston. This larger-than-life personality, movie star looks, special effects, Moses. But Moses was unqualified, y'all. And God specializes in qualifying the unqualified. So if you feel unqualified this morning, I just want you to know something. You're probably first on God's list to actually be used because God doesn't want his glory to go to some vessel who thinks they can do it without him. They have the talent, the ability, the skill, the wow factor to be able to do it without him. He wants to use regular Joes like you and I. Moses was trained in the courts of Egypt. He felt unqualified. And then he saw the injustice of an Egyptian beating up a Jew and he took the Egyptian's life. Anybody that's ever murdered someone so that you're disqualified from ministry, would you please stand to your feet this morning? Moses was not disqualified and he murdered somebody. He becomes this great figure in the Old Testament, this unbelievable leader, and he murdered somebody. And God said, you're not qualified, but I'm gonna qualify you. Christian, no matter what your brain's telling you, no matter what the devil has jumped on your back and is telling you about not being used, I want you to know something, that God uses the unqualified. He qualifies the unqualified. God can use you to see miracles happen. Woohoo! Then Moses has a conversation. Can you imagine this? I mean, the gall, the nerve, he sees the burning bush, and God says, I am that I am. Out of the bush, that would have been it for me. Okay, what are we doing today, Lord? Woohoo! Plagues, you know, whatever. Now turn to blood. Come on, Jesus. I am that I am. What? And then Moses gets in an argument with God. I can't speak well enough. You can kind of hear God running out of patience if you listen to the dialogue between Moses and God. He's like, please, Moses, don't tell me that I can't use you because you don't think you can do something. Child of God, don't subconsciously shut God out. Say it's left for other people that have more outgoing personality or whatever your excuse is. Let's not run that before God. He can use you, he wants to use you. There's things that you can do that I could never do. There's people that you know that you could impact that I could never impact. And this church right now is being mobilized to do that very thing. It might just be you smiling out in the foyer as a greeter. Somebody walks in and they see your whites and like, hey, welcome to Connect Community Church. And they're like, holy smoke, this place is different. Maybe they see you loving on your kids here at church and they see kids running around, they're so full of joy. I had somebody tell me this week as, as a youth was out having their 
water fight, this gigantic water fight, which I didn't witness all of it, but I understand that something happened at the church when I went to get, get in the foyer the next day, <laughs> okay? <laughs> something happened. It was crass and it was just crazy. But hey, that's what happens when you have youth, right? Someone told me, I saw the youth out in the yard having a water fight and they picked up on something. They said, those youth are so emotionally well-adjusted, they were having a water fight. <laughs> Listen, you are the light of the world. If you'll make yourself available, the difference that has happened to you in your life will be painfully, it'll be obvious, painfully obvious to the people around you. Don't short sell God being able to use you in your life. You think that you're not different. You don't think you have the gifts. I'm just going to tell you right now. It's a lie. The light of God inside of your countenance is enough. And people that have their spiritual feelers up and some people that don't will recognize the difference in your life. Don't be like Moses and argue with God after God has revealed all this glory in your life. Get out there and let him use you. Amen? Man, I tell you. I want to talk about the geography of a miracle. What do you mean the geography of a miracle? In this particular passage, the miracle happened in a sinner's house. When you look throughout the scriptures, Old and New Testament, everybody look this way. The miracles very rarely happen in church or synagogue. You can just find it just a little thimble full. You know where they happen? Out in the streets, at the well, out in the marketplace. They happen in a cemetery with a man that was full of demons. If you're coming to spectate a miracle, I'm telling you the miracles, the geography, where a miracle is at is out in the streets where human need is at, where human need is. And there's no way that posting a message on YouTube is gonna meet people at their need, folks. Even though we can use those tools, it was never meant to replace what God can do through individuals if you just make yourself available. I was getting my hair cut yesterday, got my ears lowered. And this same lady in downtown Portsmouth has cut my hair for 13 years. She knows everything about Rise, everything about this church. I've invited her to church multiple times. She knows right now, and so does everybody else in the salon at that time because it was packed full of people. They're working on the other side, so the other side came over to our side and everybody's there. They all know that Patty and I are taking care of Camden. And I can just see it, man, messing up people's linkage that somebody my age is trying to get involved, right? And then I tell them, I told the person that cuts my hair, I said, listen, I'm doing marriage counseling right now. She said, what you doing? I'm, I'm doing marriage counseling for one, one, two of our former students that are getting married. Faith and Chris are gonna be married in a couple of few weeks. Yeah, woo, there's a few fans out there. And she's like, what do you tell people? And there's like eight, nine people around. Well, let me just tell you some things that I tell some folks. We are Jesus with skin on. We are the body of Christ. It's not gonna be angels coming down from heaven. It's not gonna be some wonderful prophet strolling through the city of Portsmouth. It's us. It's up to us. Make yourself available. Can I tell you, it's not nearly as hard as you make it out to be, and sometimes the devil will tell you. I'm not saying you have to stand up on the street corner like Dylan and I on North Church, where we're gonna do this real soon, and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ out in the front of North Church. Don't really care what people think. If I'm some crazy street preacher, I don't care. They're gonna hear about the goodness of God, amen. You don't have to do that, though. If you're comfortable with your Jesus, people will be comfortable with you. It's that you're not comfortable with your Jesus that people think it's odd. 
If we're a little bit more comfortable talking about someone we love so much, no one's going to feel awkward. It's that we're awkward with Jesus. We got to make ourselves available and get over our awkwardness. The world is waiting, people, waiting, hungry for people just like you to stroll into their life and show them who Jesus really is. He wants to qualify you. You don't feel qualified? Great, get in line. We all don't feel qualified. He makes us qualified. The geography of a miracle is not in a synagogue, in a church. It's out in the marketplace, out in the streets, out where needs are met. That's where miracles are wrought. Man, I'm telling you, I want to be that person. Many years ago, I was out in Prescott Park, and it was the time of year where the maples carry all the helicopters. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? And the wind was blowing through the park that morning. It was coming off the water. And I'm talking about thousands of helicopters were falling that day. And I was like, I, I'm like a kid in the, rain, in the rain when stuff like this happens. I just have simple joys in my life. And God spoke to me and said, I am a seed-sowing God. God never wastes seed. He always sows way more than what's needed, right? And maybe one helicopter out of thousands and thousands will find its place in the ground and grow up and be another tree, right? But out of that one seed, thousands and thousands of more seeds. It's so funny. In our Christian walk, you've probably heard this if you've been a Christian a long time, we say, well, I'm just out sowing seeds as if we just do it out of duty. No, we're being like Father God. When we sow seeds like he sows, he always sows way more. When impregnation happens, when someone gets pregnant, seeds, millions of seeds, millions of sperm are swimming up to the egg. Millions of helicopters fall. This is how God does it. It's not some second-hand activity. It's us being like him. And he only needs one or two seeds to pop up, and then a whole tree comes up with more seeds, and we can fill the earth, the knowledge of the Lord, like the waters cover the sea, can fill the earth, folks, when we sow seeds. Sow seeds, see signs. You want to see signs and wonders? Sow seeds, baby. I hand out these flyers all over the place. We got the ones that are out there on the table, they'll be out on the table right after church where we got these little invites. You know how many of those things I've given out? Thousands over the years, thousands. I've had people look at me, you know, like I got three eyes on my forehead, but I've also had people say, what in the world is this about? I've gotten a chance to talk to people just because I made myself available. The people at Dunkin' Donuts in Islington know me by name. They know I'm a pastor. If they ever have a new employee, they hand me a coffee, I hand them an invite. Say, hey, this is a great place. I always brag about you guys. These days I brag about our church's community because I know when people come in this place with all the estrangement that's going on in people's lives with the relationship and all the dysfunction in families, when they get into this place and they feel love, I realize that that's the biggest testimony of all time with what's going on in the world. It's so divisive, so divided in so many ways, and you come in this place and people love you. Come on now. Make yourself available, sow seeds. What does that mean? Go the extra mile. Jesus said, don't just go one mile, go two miles. You can't be too busy to have a Holy Ghost stop in your life. Stop and engage people just a little extra. Patty and I have done this for years. No matter where we're at, we're, we told ourselves, no matter where we live, that southern hospitality is going to follow us. If we're going through Walmart, we're going to talk to the person that's cashing us out. We're not weird. We're not strange. We're just trying to be friendly. We go to Longhorn Steakhouse, the waiter that's waiting on us. Her name is Lynn. I said, hey, I'll remember that name. That's my last name, Lynn. Lynn is an incredible, incredible waitress. We got a chance to talk to her and to minister to her. 
Being available just means you take one little extra step and let God have an opportunity to move in your life. I've seen Rory. Rory is like one of the most friendliest people ever. If you ever go someplace and you just want to get in and out, don't take Rory because he wants to talk to people. He wants to have coffee with them. He wants to use that big, bold, beautiful smile of his and talk to people. And guess what? So many doors have been opened up just because Rory wasn't in a hurry all the time. Sometimes we are. And he decided to engage with people. And so many doors have opened up. People on the stage the last few weeks is just because Rory goes the extra mile with people. They love him and he brings them into the kingdom. That's his gift. That's what he does. Folks, make yourself available just to people. God can do things through your life. Never ceases to amaze me that when we're available, God will bring the people that have a need to you. All the years, and I know we're a church, we're positioned here by the highway, all the years that I've been the pastor, I've very rarely, just a, a handful of people, I can count them on one hand that I've had to turn away from helping here at the church. There's so much need and it's not too far from your front door, from your workstation, at your workplace, from your school desk. They're right there. We just have to take that extra step. And when we sow seeds, we're gonna see signs. How many of you all wanna see miracles? Don't look to a preacher any longer. Look to your God and make yourself available. Are you out there? Say amen. amen. There's an old adage that says, if you wanna see the fruit, you gotta get out on a limb. You could probably put that as the mantra of our church over the last 11 years. Man, we've been out on a limb many times. Matter of fact, I've taken risk in this church, leading this church, many times I've taken a risk. And let me tell you something about taking a risk. You understand that there's a lot of people that could be affected by your risk when you're a leader of a church. You understand that you could take the church the wrong way. You could understand that it could not work Anybody want to lead a group of people and try something and it not work? It's not always fun. And this may seem strange to you, but in my thinking, especially in the first few years of leading this church, I stepped out and took a risk. I got out on a limb, and this is the reason why I did it. And listen, you're not going to find this in any kind of church growth handbook. I said to myself, where the church is right now, I either have to decide to take a risk and I hadn't thought even what I was gonna do yet because this is really sad. I'll pray for your pastor. It wasn't gonna get any better. It may get worse in the next few months. So I had to decide based on it not being better but worse over the next few months if this was the right time to do it. Only 1% of the churches, I'm gonna give God some glory right here. Is that okay? Only 1% of the churches go from a plateauing to a dying situation to go back to their former self. It's funny, last week, we had more people in church, y'all, than at the high point when the sanctuary was built. We had more people in church on a summer day. It's really awesome. And I realize, and I give God the glory, that he put me in as pastor because he knew that I was gonna take some risk when we needed it. And again, I'll say it to you. There were times in the life of this church in the very beginning, I didn't take a risk because everything was there, everything was provided for, we had everything we needed. Matter of fact, none of that was the case. I took a risk at a certain time because I knew it was going to get worse. Full knowledge of that. In other words, if this fails, we'll be in a doubly worse situation. Look, never, ever tried to lead this church even for one second, taking the risk that I have, not thinking that at the end of the limb, there could be some fruit. There was no guarantees, but that's where the fruit is, when you get out on a limb. Folks, we don't need another ministry we don't need some new leader with a ministry that will take risk. We need people organically, innately, to stand up and take a risk for Jesus. 
and your risk might just be getting on the greeting team. That may be the scariest notion for you. I'm not talking about leading a church. Your risk may, hey, you may be at work and asking somebody for prayer that you have not asked for prayer in your workplace ever. That may be the risk that God wants you to take. It's time for all of us to say, I'm available, God. I'm gonna take a risk in my personal life. Don't wait for a ministry to be set up. Don't wait for a ministry initiative. God wants you to step out on the limb where the fruit is, baby. Peter did it, and right in the middle of his message, the Holy Spirit fell. Woohoo! I've told this story several times, and this is it. This is the end of the message. I just want you to know how unqualified I was, how ill-equipped I was, and how really I, I did nothing to make something happen. I've said this story, and I've remembered this. I've told this story. I've remembered this um, all these years because of this one fact, that it wasn't the right time, the right place, or the right person, but God still moved. Here I am on the mission field, Parents are getting up to take their kids, get their kids. I'm on the mission field. We're speaking a different language. I'm in Bonaire, which is a sister island to Aruba, okay? And I was ready, man. I wanted to go out and witness to people. I want to tell people about Jesus. So I'm out there with an interpreter. And I knock on this door, and this dear woman answers the door. And again, I've told this story, but I just want to help you if, you if you're trying to make this shift, make this change. I knock on this door. Listen, there's so many people in this room that know the Bible way more than I did. I was only a year and a half old in the Lord. I knock on this woman's door. And we introduce ourselves. And I ask this dear lady, I said, do you know who Jesus is? And she has no clue who Jesus is. You're not talking to a theologian now. You're not talking to somebody that's been trained in Bible school. So I'm like, what do I do now? <laughs> what do I do? So I thought, okay, let's be more basic. What about Adam and Eve? You know, if, if she didn't know who Jesus was, she's not gonna know who Adam and Eve are. So she's drawn a blank. She doesn't know who Adam and Eve are. She's never heard of Jesus. And in the middle of our conversation where I'm drawing a blank, because I don't even know what else to say, this woman has no paradigm, no background in Bible understanding, the Holy Spirit comes down like a blanket, just like in this passage comes down like a blanket and I see her countenance change. Immediately, something happens. She goes from greeting us to a little bit more somber. I'm like, okay. I don't even really know what's going on. I'm so new as a Christian, I don't understand. We walk away, we invite her to church. We walk away, I'm walking down the street with the interpreter and he says this to me. Man, she got touched by the Lord. And I'm thinking to myself, by what? Nothing I said resonated. She did not understand a thing that I said, but the Holy Spirit came down because I made myself available. That same Holy Spirit operates in your life. He wants to use you. He wants to flow through you. Let's quit having church just in a building. Let's have church out there. This woman came to church that night. She was born again. She got gloriously saved. We went back the next year. She was still there. Do you realize this morning it had nothing to do with me? It had nothing to do with my knowledge, nothing to do with my skill. I was just so available. Amen?